zero five has no classes on Monday anyway. Twenty <coughs> eighth lecture, we start Z transforms today. Introduction to the Z transform. Z transforms are transforms from the time domain to the frequency domain for discrete time signals, DTS. Z transforms are applicable to discrete time systems only. And the <coughs> Z transforms comes about the same way as continuous time Fourier transform CTFT in which the variable is omega is generalized to Laplace transform. Continuous time Fourier transform is generalized to Laplace transform by going from j omega to sigma plus j omega. That is we introduce a, a real part sigma and that is how we go from j omega to s. Alright. What does this do? This enlarges the capability of the transform to handle much wider class of signals and systems. This was the motivation for continuous time Fourier transform for going from continuous time Fourier transform to Laplace transform. I also asked a question and discussed an answer to this. Then why have Fourier transforms at all? Why not work only in terms of Laplace transform? If a tool is much more versatile than another tool, obviously when you go to the market you do not buy both. You buy only the most versatile one. Then why why not work with Laplace transforms only and forget about Fourier transform? What is the main use of Fourier transform? I had answered the question, I had discussed the question. No? You do not remember? All right, I leave the question unanswered. All right. Similarly, in a similar manner, the Z transform is a generalization from DTFT, discrete time Fourier transform, to Z transform. And what we do essentially is this. You know that if I have a signal X of N, if I have a sequence X of N, then it is discrete time Fourier transform DTFT is given by e to the minus j omega n. You multiply by this and then sum up from n equal to minus infinity to plus infinity and this is capital X of I had written omega earlier. Now, we shall write this in a slightly different form, but we will come back to what the argument is a little later. Now, <coughs> Is there a problem on the existence of the discrete time Fourier transform? Let us write it omega, we will change it later. Is there a problem on the existence or does it always exist? It does not necessarily exist. X of n must be absolutely summable. It is that condition under which, it is a sufficient condition under which the discrete time Fourier transform shall exist. All right. Now, what we do is, we notice that the variable here this is a series, an infinite series in the variable e to the power minus j omega, all right, or in the variable e to the power j omega. So, what we do is e to the j omega, we now generalize to a e to the j omega, what is the magnitude? 1. So, we now generalize to a quantity which has the same angle omega, but a magnitude which is not necessarily equal to 1. In other words, we, we introduce a factor r. We generalize from e to the j omega to r e to the j omega, all right, where r may be 1. If it is 1, then we get the discrete time Fourier transform. If it is not 1, then we get a new transform. Now, you notice that in the earlier case, that is from continuous time Fourier transform to Laplace transform, what we did was omega, j omega, was generalized to sigma plus j omega. In other words, we, we worked with rectangular coordinates, a real axis, a real axis and an imaginary axis. Whereas, 
in the case of Z transform, we work with polar coordinates. That is, we specify a complex quantity. This is complex. This is also complex. We specify the complex quantity by its distance from the origin, which is R, and the angle it makes with the positive real axis, that is omega, all right. So, <coughs> one difference is that Laplace transform, we work in rectangular coordinates, in Z transforms, we work with polar coordinates, and the generalization f is from discrete time Fourier transform. What we do is e to the g omega, we generalize to r e to the g omega, and we give this a new name, a new variable small z. Please do distinguish between cap z and small z. I will write cap z like this and small z I will write with a slash at the middle. And therefore, if I wish to generalize the Fourier transform, discrete time Fourier transform to a new transform with the variable e to the j omega replaced by z, then obviously what my definition should be is x of n z to the minus n n tends to infinity n equal to minus infinity to plus infinity and this is indeed the definition of x sub z. This is indeed the definition of the z transform of the sequence of the sequence x of n provided it exists. There is a uh, <coughs> there is an uncomfortable question about the existence of the of these transforms and this will come a little later. We will also see that exactly like Laplace transform, there is a question of region of convergence. Region of convergence can be easily appreciated by looking at the definition itself that this summation, doubly infinite summation may or may not converge. Even if it converges, it might converge for some values of R, it may not converge for other values of R. All right? Z after all is R e to the g omega and therefore depending on the value of R, it may converge it may not converge and therefore there is a question of region of convergence. Now we go back to the uh, <coughs> to the question of what should be the argument. You see the Z transform is exactly equal to the Fourier transform if Z is equal to e to the power g omega and therefore instead of omega we write this argument as x of e to the g omega to bring conformity with the Z transform and to to uh, derive some of the properties of the Z transform from what we know already about Fourier transforms. All right, let me state this <coughs> more precisely. If X of n is a given sequence, given X of n, then its Z transform, provided it exists, is defined by n equal to minus infinity to plus infinity X of n Z to the minus n. And uh, this is uh, denoted like this, cap z of x of n or the other way around is x of n capital X sub z either way and we can write cap z here that is x of n under z transformation gives x sub z capital X sub z under z inverse transformation gives x of n. The inversion we shall consider a little later. Let us consider the forward transform first and see what are the properties of this transformation. One thing that is clear is that, <coughs> that if the Fourier transform exists, that is the Fourier transform of X of n, if it exists, then it must be the Z transform of X of n with R equal to 1 or Z equal to e to the power g omega, all right. This we shall continue to uh, appeal to, to be able to derive some of the properties of Z transforms. That is, the Fourier transform, the Z transform of X of n with Z equal to e to the g omega is the Fourier transform of X of n if it exists, it may or may not exist, all right. Now, <coughs> before we pass further, let us also get acquainted with the style of representing the z plane. The z plane is as usual if you if you relate it to the real to the rectangular coordinates then you say real part z j imaginary part of z. Now because of the connection between the z transform and the Fourier transform 
the Fourier transform is the Z transform under the condition Z equal to E to the J omega and Z in general is represented by R E to the J omega in general the and polar coordinates have been taken account of therefore the most important transition line the most important transition line in the S plane was the J omega axis you could go to the right or to the left all right and you saw that it has links with right sided signals and left sided signals and so on. In the z plane therefore, the most important line is r equal to 1 which is a circle and because the radius of the circle is 1, well on this circle the mod of z is equal to 1, mod of z is equal to 1 and this is therefore called the unit circle. And whatever we have said in the Laplace transform with the j omega axis, now we shall repeat here with reference to the unit circle. Inside the unit circle will mean one region, outside the unit circle shall mean another region. Infinity of course is a circle with a radius of plus infinity or minus infinity, plus j infinity or minus j infinity. And wherever it is convenient we shall consider infinity as a single point. But this is the style of our working that is in the Z transform we shall always refer to a circle or sometimes old fashioned books write it as a ring, ring with center at the origin. And you shall see that all our ROCs and all properties shall be described with reference to circles and the unit circle shall play a very particular uh, significant role in this whole discussion. Now if I write, if I go back to the definition given x of n, if x sub z converges, if x sub z exists then you see it is x of n, n equals minus infinity to plus infinity, z to the minus n and z is r e to the j omega. So it is r to the n e to the minus j omega n, n equals minus infinity to plus infinity. And if I now bracket this function, then it is obvious that x sub z is the Fourier transform of x of n r to the minus n, exactly like Laplace transform. Laplace transform was Fourier transform of x of t e to the power minus sigma t and we called e to the minus sigma t as the convergence factor. That is the Fourier transform of a sequence exactly like that, here the Fourier transform of x of n may or may not exist, but Fourier transform of x of n r to the minus n may exist with a proper choice of r, alright. In other words, this summation may converge. This sequence x of n r to the minus n may be absolutely summable, whereas the summation of x of n may not be absolutely summable, alright. And this, this is what makes the Z transform a much more versatile apparatus or a tool as compared to the discrete time Fourier transform. So the uh, <coughs> X sub Z is the Fourier transform of X of N R to the minus N. And this incidentally also tells you that the ROCs, the regions of convergence, in other words the regions in the Z plane where this summation converges shall depend only on r, it does not depend on omega and therefore the ROCs by a simple look, by a simple uh, close look at the definition and its relationship to Fourier transform, you notice that the ROCs must be rings in the Z plane, ROCs must be bounded by circles in the Z plane because they only depend on R. Now if R is constant and omega varies, obviously what you describe is a circle and therefore the ROCs in the Laplace case, the ROCs were strips bounded by lines parallel, parallel to the J omega axis. Here it shall be, it shall be lines parallel to the unit circle and all lines parallel to the unit circle form a circle and therefore the ROCs are rings. What was the logic? That they depend on R only, they do not depend on omega. omega. 
in the Laplace transform case, they depended only on the real part of S, not on the imaginary part, and therefore it was a vertical line. All right. So this is property one of ROC, that the region of convergence must uh, must be in the form of a ring. Now uh, the Fourier transform. Well, let us go back to this x of e to the g omega, the Fourier transform is x of z, z equal to e to the g omega, all right. Now, obviously, the existence of Fourier transform can be, can be concluded, existence or otherwise of Fourier transform can be investigated if the ROC of x of z is given. If the ROC of x sub z does not include the unit circle, then obviously the Fourier transform does not exist. Is that clear? Exactly like Laplace and Fourier, Fourier transform of a continuous time function exists if the ROC of the Laplace transform includes the g omega axis. Here, because x sub z on the unit circle is the Fourier transform. Now, if x sub z itself does not converge in the unit circle, obviously x sub e to the g omega shall not exist. So, let me write it down for d t f t of x of n to exist is a very important and significant statement, very similar to the Laplace transform statement. For d t f t of x of n to exist, x of z r o c must include must include the unit circle and you understand what the unit circle is that is the unit circle is this the the locus of mod z magnitude z equal to 1. Let us see how the ROCs come about in practice how the ROCs come about in practice and we take as usual some very simple examples first example we take x of n equals to a to the n u n. a to the n u n is a sequence which exists only for n greater than equal to 0. So, it is a right sided sequence R S S. All right. To find out the z transform of this, let us apply the definition blindly and then see where does it converge. All right x sub z is summation a to the n, z to the minus n and because of u n, we shall have n equal to 0 to infinity, all right, which is obviously a g p and can be summed, can and will become convergent provided, well the sum is 1 minus a z inverse, all right, 1 minus provided mod a z inverse is less than 1 that is it. and this itself determines the ROC. What is the ROC? By definition it is the range of z, pardon me? Okay. Mod z greater than a, mod a, a could also be positive or negative, we do not care, all right. Now, this itself defines the region of convergence. Region of convergence by definition is the range of z for which the summation x n z to the minus n in minus infinity to plus infinity converges and therefore by definition this is the region of convergence and you can see that if you draw a unit circle, if you draw a circle of radius mod a, then the region of convergence is mod z greater than mod a that means outside this circle, all right. Now, we have not said what a is, whether a is greater than 1, mod a is greater than 1 or less than 1. Suppose mod a is greater than 1, that is the unit circle is somewhere here. Suppose mod a is less than 1, that is this is the unit circle, this is the unit circle, then obviously the Fourier transform shall exist. On the other hand, if mod A is greater than 1, F T, D T, F T does not exist because the ROC shall not include the unit circle. Is the point clear? All right. Uh, <coughs> we can write this in a slightly different form. X sub Z 
equals to 1 by 1 minus a z inverse. Is this a rational function? It is a rational function in z inverse, z inverse. It, it can also be written as z by z minus a. So, it is also a rational function in z. A rational function in z inverse is also a rational function of z. All that you have to do is to is to do away with the inverse powers. That is, you multiply by z both numerator and denominator. And any rational function can therefore be characterized, can be characterized by a, by poles, by its poles, its zeros and a scaling constant. And in this case, you notice that the zero is at z equal to zero, the origin. The pole, if a, for example, let us say a is real and uh, positive. Then the pole is at A, all right. This is the pole zero diagram, and you see that the ROC is outside this circle. That means ROC is bounded by a circle passing through the pole. There is only one pole. As you shall see later, for right sided sequences, the ROC shall be bounded by the by a circle passing through the pole which is farthest from the origin, all right, farthest from the origin. In other words, in a sense, RSS, right sided sequences, if the Z transform exists, they give rise to ROCs which extend to infinity. Is that okay? Extend to infinity. That is, mod Z would be some finite value b less than infinity, not less than, it can go right up to infinity this. Now, in this case for example, in this case for example, can we say a less than mod z less than equal to infinity, can we put an equality sign here? No, because ROCs cannot include poles, this is property number 2. At poles by definition x of z blows up, it does not converge and therefore, ROCs cannot contain poles and therefore, this sign should be strictly an inequality sign. If we consider this example again, A to the n u n and the ROC and the z transform is 1 minus A z inverse mod z greater than mod A. Obviously, if A equal to 1, then you get x of n equal to u of n, the unit step function and its Fourier trans and its z transform obviously is 1 minus z inverse mod z greater than 1. The unit step function is therefore very closely related to the unit circle. The unit step function has a z transform whose ROC is outside the unit circle, all right. We will come back to uh, u of minus n a little later. <coughs> now, let us let us uh, let us repeat this. This function will, will keep on coming x of n a to the n u n is uh, capital X sub z equal to 1 by 1 minus a z inverse uh, mod z greater than mod a. Now, suppose we consider another example in which x of n is equal to minus a to the n exactly like Laplace transform. Instead of u of minus t, we use u of not minus n, but minus n minus 1. All right. Let us see why why you include this. Obviously, this is a sequence. This is zero. This is a sequence which starts from n equal to minus one and then goes on like this. It could be decaying if a is yes <laughs> greater than one because n itself is negative. All right. So it will be decaying. It could also be growing. All right. Let us find out the z transform of this sequence x of n equal to minus a to the n u of minus n minus 1. 
then by definition capital X sub z is minus summation n equals minus infinity to plus infinity a to the n u of minus n minus 1 z to the minus n and this is equal to since u of minus n minus 1 exists for n less than or equal to minus 1 the lower limit can be changed to n equal to minus 1 all right that is correct so this is changed to n equal to minus 1 and this remains n equal to minus infinity this remains n equal to minus infinity and then we can get rid of this factor u of minus n minus 1 let's cl clear the mess we have n equal to minus infinity n equal to minus 1 minus a to the n z to the minus n suppose we change n to n prime suppose we change n to minus n prime all right then this will be minus n prime this will be plus n prime and this will be minus n prime and minus n prime which will make a change of variable all right is the game clear what we get is the following we get a summation a inverse z to the power n now we can go back to n a inverse z to the power n and n goes from 1 to infinity does the negative sign remain yes, yes the negative sign remains unfortunately or fortunately <laughs> we will see we will see and therefore capital X sub z equal to minus summation I repeat this n equal to 1 a inverse z to the power n now this I can write as let us include n equal to 0 let us include n equal to 0 then obviously I must add a 1 all right so this is a GP and it sums up to 1 minus a inverse z provided a inverse z mod is less than 1 which means that mod z is greater than ah, mod z is less than mod a all right let me write this again capital X sub z mind you the, the, the sequence is minus a to the n u of minus n minus 1 capital X sub z is 1 minus 1 by 1 minus a inverse z provided mod z is less than mod a and therefore the ROC is now obvious we have a circle of radius a mod a and the ROC is inside the circle and it happened because because our sequence was a left sided sequence and this shall always be the case for left sided sequences the region of convergence shall be inside a unit in, inside a circle whereas for right sided sequence the ROC shall be outside a circle all right now if I simplify this we get a very interesting result if I simplify this I get 1 minus a by a minus z not z <laughs> okay this is equal to a minus z and here what do we get minus z and therefore this is z by z minus a mod z less than mod a x sub z and if you recall a to the n u of n gave the same x sub z it gave the same x sub z that is it was equal to z by z minus a but mod z was greater than mod a and the purpose of taking this example is to show you show to you that <coughs> that the ROC is an extremely important criterion extremely important character of the z transform it it specifies or it signifies the nature of the sequence that you started with all right the, the algebraic expressions are the same but the ROCs are quite different ROCs are quite different means that the sequences are quite different and therefore whenever you write x sub z if you forget to write the region of convergence it does not make sense all right it is like uh, <coughs> t 
taking a flower to the temple without a sprinkling of uh, sandalwood. Isn't that right? That's what makes it uh, palatable to gods. I'm told. I don't know. Now, this will in general be true that for right-sided sequences, the arrow says, for right-sided, I, I write it again, arrow says will be outside some circle, let's say R1. For left-sided sequences, R O C S would be inside some circle, let's say, of radius R2. Obviously, if the sequence is two-sided, okay, there are three possibilities. For R S S, it is this. For L S S, it is this. For two-sided, obviously, it shall be and you will have ring, it shall be like this. It shall be in between the two, provided, provided, what? Which radius must be bigger? Obviously, second one must be bigger, but second one signifies. That means R2 must be greater than R1. That is correct, provided this happens. If it does not happen, then no, no, no. Then the Z transform does not exist. All right. And if the unit circle happens to be inside this, then the Fourier transform of the sequence shall exist. If the unit circle is outside this or inside this smaller circle, then the Fourier transform does not exist. These points have to be uh, have to be kept in mind. That's why I'm, I'm hammering this again and again. Now, Z transform obviously is a linear operation. That is, if X of N is X1 of N plus X2 of N, obviously capital X of Z is capital X1, let us multiply by A and B to be general plus B X2 of Z. Now, that is a linear operation because of the definition. But then the ROCs have to be carefully chalked out. The ROC of X sub Z, if this ROC is R1 and if this is ROC is R2, then obviously the ROC of X sub Z shall be at least the intersection of R1 and R2. Let us take an example. Let us say X of N is the sum of two right sided sequences. Let us say uh, A to the N U N plus B to the N U N, where A and B are real positive and uh, B is greater than A, let us say. All right. Then the Z transform <coughs> capital X sub Z shall be 1 by 1 minus A Z inverse plus 1 by 1 minus B Z inverse the ROC of this shall be mod Z greater than A and the ROC of this shall be mod Z greater than B. And therefore, the ROC of X sub Z shall be at least the intersection. What is the intersection? Obviously, mod Z. I told you B is greater than A. So, it should be B, mod Z greater than B. No, I mod <laughs> <laughs> you forget what I wrote here. A and B are real, both are positive, and B greater than A. I set my, uh, what do you call them, in a chessboard? What, what are those? Pieces. 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 No. Pawns. P A W L. I set my pawns correctly. <laughs> so, it is also called setting the rules of the game and playing the game. Okay. Next, we consider the properties of ROC. Some properties we have already <laughs> we have already discussed. First, we have said that the ROC ROC is a ring. Second, we have said ROC cannot include a pole. These are obvious, all right. Uh, ROC cannot include a pole. What was the logic for uh, a ring? What is the logic? Pardon me? The 
It does not depend on omega, it simply depends on R to power R. And therefore it must be bounded by circles of constant, of radius R. ROC cannot include a pole, what is the logic? At a pole, the function cannot convert. Three, if it is a finite duration sequence, finite duration sequence, then what do you think the ROC would be? Nothing or the whole plane. It turns out, it turns out that for a finite duration sequence, the Z transform always exists. There is no question of non-existence. It always exists. Finite duration sequence, Z transform always exists. It is, it is the region of convergence, ROC, will just demonstrate this and prove it if you, if you require. The ROC is all Z except, now you notice the difference. In the Laplace transform case, for a finite duration, nicely behaved time function, it was the complete S plane. Here, except Z equal to 0 or and or Z equal to infinity. That is, one of them shall be excluded. Either z equal to 0 or z equal to infinity or both shall be excluded. Now, let us first get a feel of what we mean. Let us first get a feel of what we mean. Suppose, suppose we have a right sided sequence like this. This is n, 0 and 1. Both are 1. What is capital X sub z? You can write by inspection 1 plus z inverse. Does it have a pole? It has a pole at z equal to 0. And therefore, z equal to 0 cannot be in the ROC. Alright? So, the ROC of this is all z except z equal to 0. And why did this occur? Because it is a right sided sequence. Alright? Why can we say it could be negative part. On the negative part also. All right. So this is the exception. Let's say minus one, zero, and one. Suppose all of them are one. Then this sequence has z plus one plus z inverse. This has a pole at the origin as well as infinity. Therefore, the ROC of this sequence would be all z except z equal to 0 and z equal to infinity. On the other hand, if you have a left sided sequence starting at n equal to 0, if we have a left sided sequence starting at n equal to 0, let us say like this, 0 and minus 1, then obviously the ROC, the Z transform is 1 plus, simply 1 plus Z. And the ROC cannot include now the point at infinity. Therefore, all Z except Z equal to infinity. All right. So, a finite duration signal, a finite, do you need a proof anymore? Is a proof needed? No. If needed, then you prove it exactly like we did in the uh, Laplace transform case. Okay. What we shall prove now is the next property, that is property 4, P4. This requires a formal proof. And let, me, uh, let me state it. If X of n is RSS and that is we are now going to prove that for a right sided sequence for an RSS, the ROC is, is outside a circle. This is what we are going to prove now formally. All right. So, what we have to prove is if X of n is ROC, uh, RSS and its ROC, its ROC does not mean anything. We must be precise. And the ROC of capital X sub Z, which is the Z transform of X of n. We are now stating a theorem, so we must be careful. Okay. If X of n is RSS and the 
arrow C if it hurts anybody write down the full name right sided sequence. If X of n is RSS and the ROC of capital X of Z is the Z transform of X of n includes includes mod Z equal to some value R0 that is includes a circle of radius R0 then the ROC must include must include all Z all z such that mod z is greater than r 0. That means, if it includes a circle of radius r 0, then it includes all circles, all region which whose radii, whose distance from the origin is greater than r 0. That means, it extends right up to infinity and that is what you mean by outside a unit circle. Is the theorem, is the statement clear? Now, the, the proof is very simple. The proof says that x of z with mod z equal to r 0 converges. This is the hypothesis, this is the statement of the theorem, this is the given part of the theorem that is summation x of n r 0 to the minus n x of n r 0 to the minus n must be absolutely summable. That means, this is less than infinity. All right. And by, <coughs> by the assumption x of n is right sided sequence and therefore, the summation goes from some value let us say n 0 to infinity. All right. Now, this n 0 can be either greater than 0 or less than 0. Suppose, first of all, we take n 0 to be greater than or equal to 0. If n 0 is greater than or equal to 0, then what happens to this summation n equal to n 0 to infinity mod x of n instead of r 0, we take r 0 plus delta where delta is greater than 0. What happens to this? n is positive now. And therefore, if I take the reciprocal of, if I take 1 by r 0 plus delta to the n, obviously this would be less than 1 by r 0 to the power n. And therefore, this would be less than infinity. In other words, if n 0 is non-negative, if n 0 is greater than or equal to 0, that is if the right sided sequence starts either at n equal to 0 or to the right of n equal to 0, then all for all delta this sum is absolutely convergent, all right, which means that the ROC includes all values of R greater than R naught. The only problem is if N0 is negative, all right, what happens? Let us see. If N0 is less than 0, suppose N0 is minus some quantity, uh, give me a quantity M. Suppose n0 is minus n. Then what we have to consider is summation x of n r0 plus delta to the minus n summation n equal to minus m to infinity. And this summation, is that clear? This is what we have to investigate. We have to show if possible that this is less than infinity. Now, obviously, this summation can be written in terms of two summations, n equal to minus m to minus 1 plus summation n equal to 0 to infinity. And this summation, we have already shown it is less than infinity. What about this summation? Can it blow up? It is a finite sum and therefore, it must be less than infinity. And two quantities which are individually less than infinity add up to a quantity less than infinity. All right, is the proof clear? I am leaving out the proof of the other uh, theorem, the next property, but let me state this once more clearly. What we have proved is the following, that if x of n is right sided sequence and ROC of x of z includes if x of n is RSS and ROC of x z includes mod z equal to r 0, then 
the ROC extends to all z such that mod z greater than RC. This is what we have proved. The next property is a simple modification of this and that concerns left sided sequence. If x of n is LSS and ROC of xz includes mod z equal to R0, then the ROC extends to all z such that mod z less than R0. And it can be proved in an exactly similar manner and this is property 5. <coughs> Is a proof clear? The next property we have already demonstrated. That is, if X of n is neither RSS nor LSS, if it is a 2SS, two sided sequence, then its ROC must be an annular ring bounded by mod z equal to R1 and mod z equal to R2, where what is the significance of R1 and R2? this is R1 and this is R2. The region of convergence is this shaded annular region. What is R2? Let us remember once again. R2 is the, is the boundary of the ROC of the left sided sequence. Okay? You must be precise. And R1 is the boundary, R1 defines the boundary of the ROC of Right sided, right sided sequence. All right. Does it require a proof? No. Can you can you show that if uh, if uh, the ROC includes a circle of radius r zero, then it cannot include. <laughs> can you state this precisely? If it includes a circle of radius r zero, then the ROC cannot include all mod z greater than r0 or all mod z less, less than r0. Be careful about this statement. Then it becomes either right sided or left sided sequence. It does not remain two sided. Yeah, if r1 can, can the z transform include the whole plane ever? For a finite, for a finite, not the whole plane, one of them shall be excluded. So Either zero to the infinity, sir, it does not matter. Sir, so we are talking about the complete plane, sir, in that he excludes z equal to infinity. Uh, so cannot equal 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 equal. Then it is not the complete plane. Sir, <laughs> so even the uh, include that equal complete, to that This is the difference between Laplace, Laplace and z transform. Laplace transform, there are x of s which are valid at all values of s. Whereas the z transform of necessity you have to exclude. Either z equal to 0 or z equal to infinity or both. Alright? This is a difference which you must uh, recognize and remember. Finally, finally we consider a finite duration sequence. Let us say x of n is a to the n for n between 0 and let us say capital N minus 1 and it is 0 otherwise. Now, by our arguments so far, this the ROC of this shall, what shall be the ROC? All z except Either or both. Now, I have already told you, I have given you the sequence. You must be able to. Infinity, are you sure? Well, if it is not infinity, it has to be 0, is it? Except z equal to 0. Alright. Now, obviously, this function, this function cannot have a pole at any location except z equal to 0. Is not that right? The function obviously shall have poles because you have what you have is 1 plus a z inverse plus etc. to infinity. Obviously not infinity. 
a z to the minus n plus 1. Obviously, when z equal to 0, the function blows up. How many poles are there? Not one. There are n minus 1 poles. There are n minus 1 poles. All lumped at z equal to 0. The function obviously cannot have any other poles. All poles at z equal to 0. Now, every rational function has the same number of poles and zeros. All zeros at infinity. No, that is not correct. At infinity, will be one. at infinity, the value is 1. It is not a 0. In fact, the zeros, as we shall show next time, you see, in the, in the Laplace transform case, for such functions, the zeros are distributed along a vertical line parallel to the g omega axis. In this case, we will show next time that the zeros are distributed on a circle. Not unit, <laughs> on a circle of radius A. Alright, we will show this next time.